check out the placement of the handles. Measure in an inch and a half. These are going to be going at an angle. Now I'm not wanting to mark too hard on the the wood because if I do it will indent or put an impression on the wood and it'll be hard to sand out that line so I'm very being very careful not to dent the wood just just putting a line on there just light enough so that I can see where to drill the holes so I want to come in an inch and a half on from each edge and then three and five eighths in from that edge to drill the holes to mount my handles. Now to double check to make sure that my measurements are correct I'll measure center to center is three inches so I'll burn an inch so I can have more accurate reading and it's right at three inches so we're good to go. Now I'll do the same this side I don't much like doing this because you can get off on your lines unless you have a notch in here but you can come across here and scribe a real light line at inch and a half and that's probably a, a better rule for carpentry but I like to make sure I'm off there a little bit your pencil can wander some if you do it that way using the square but it is it is a method you can use three and five eighths three and five eighths measure across burn an inch and we got three inches that looks good so now I know where to drill my holes so I'll highlight those by putting a little dimple in there with my pencil and we'll need to determine how big of a hole we need 31 128 but if you make it a quarter inch it gives you just a tiny bit of play in there so this could recess into the hole and then you screw it from the back side while I'm at the drill press I'll go ahead and drill the holes on the back side for the hinges to go. Now on the hinges I just like to drop down two inches to the top edge of the hinge hold the hinge in place and then make little dimples right in the center of where the screws are going to be and that just has to be a, a real tiny pilot hole just to you know just to get your screw started you could probably even do it without the pilot hole but if you put a pilot hole in there and just you know go down maybe a quarter of an inch then your screws are going nice and straight I had these doors set up just the way I wanted them with the knots characteristics and whatnot kind of spread out a little bit there we go All right, now we're ready to uh, round the edges. I'm just putting a simple edge on here, just a quarter inch radius. Uh, this particular bit has two different shapes that you can work with. You can do either one of these shapes just by raising or lowering the router guide here. So, but I'm just looking for something simple, something that's easy to clean, wipe down. And so that's why I like this to use this uh, quarter, quarter round on this particular uh, set of cabinets. Anytime I uh, router something I always like to do the edge grain board first and then the parallel grain next and the reason for that is is that if you take and router this side first and then router this side 
this side sometimes has a ten tendency to want to chip out so this is just a little bit more holding on this edge here if you router this edge first okay yeah if you guys are paying attention I probably should secure the work to the table and this side here has a little window so if you have that side facing you and you have a little bit more of the this pad on top of your work then you have a little bit more control a little more displacement with the guide and everything having a little bit more surface area to ride on so your router doesn't want to wave around a little bit this isn't so bad because I have a I have a roller here and that'll keep me from gouging or chipping or anything like that as far as on the inside edge so I'm not too worried about that Now a real important thing to note on using any router, and that depends on your how sharp your bit is and everything too, is that you can go too fast and it will slow down it'll slow down the router and then the router will want to start to try to gouge because uh, it's trying to remove too much material at once. Or you can go too slow and you can start burning your wood. Here we are over at the drill press and I got a sixteenth of an inch drill just for the pilot holes for the hinge screws. And then I got a quarter inch Forstner bit for the holes that the handle is going to penetrate and for the screws to be able to come in from the back side. So we're going to go ahead and do this first. I put this little piece of tape on here as a depth control so when the tape hits the top of the work then i know that i'm deep enough for my pilot hole it's a good thing to put those on there especially if you're worried about running clear through the the work piece because you don't want to run clear through the work piece with this particular hole that was on the back side of the cabinet door now I have to flip over the door to access the little dimple marks or the markings for where I drilled a quarter inch hole into the front of the cabinet door Now with this soft wood like this, uh, when you punch the Forstner bit through, uh, sometimes it'll have a tendency to chip out like that, especially on real soft woods. And there's a way that you can avoid that by taking a bit like this and running it clear through to start with, and then setting up your Forstner bit with a piece of tape like this to run in halfway. You know, you run your Forstner bit in halfway on each side, and then you flip over the piece, and then you continue going in from this side with the Forstner bit, and that will make your holes look a little bit more fresher and cleaner. I'm not too concerned about it because the, the fasteners are going to be covering up the back sides of this, so I'm not too worried about or being a little bit of tear out right there. So... But if I really wanted to be meticulous about it, I could have taken a 16-inch drill bit, 
drill through so I, I have a perfect hole clear through the other side. So I'd have a guide to put the pointed tip of the Forstner bit into the pilot hole and continue drilling from the other side to avoid tear out. Okay, these are ready for finished sanding. And that cabinet, uh, other than a little bit of sanding, is ready for a finish. <laughs> Now that I've uh, unearthed this uh, piece of plywood here, I have to cut this in three pieces to finish out all the cabinets. And I'm going to mark them at 30 inch lengths. This is going to be the widest cabinet, and that's going to be at 36 inches, and that's going to go right over where Heidi does a lot of her videotape in there in the kitchen. This one ha here has to be 30 inches long. And it's the widest one, it's 36 inches wide. And after I cut this piece off, I'm going to cut these next two panels down to, let's see, 29 and an eighth. I will cut this one first. This one here will be cut at 35 and an eighth by 30. Why isn't it 36 inches, you ask? Well, that's a good question. Not sure if you can tell by this picture or not, but it has to fit 3 eighths of an inch in from each side because there's going to be a dado or excuse me a rabbit joint on the back side so that backing has to fit inside of this rabbit joint and so that's going to be half of the width of the plywood which is three quarters of an inch as you can see the 36 inches would come to this point so you got to back over three eighths of an inch on this side and three-eighths of an inch on the other side in so that's going to be three-quarters of an inch three-eighths plus three-eighths is a three-quarters so what's going to happen is that has to be three-quarters of an inch less but then I also want the fascia or the face boards to be on the outside of the front so let's say we have the fascia that goes on here, the face boards, I want the face boards to be a sixteenth inch overhanging this side on each end. It has to be a little bit more narrow yet in order to accommodate my wishes for the, for the face board. Well, now the reason why you let those overhang a little bit is so when you draw those cabinets together they'll be a nice tight fit so if there's any bowing or any deviation in the side panel that's not going to show up when you suck these two sides together you want you want a nice tight fit between this fascia and the the next fascia so that's the reason for the narrower dimension why it's not going to be 36 it's going to be 35 and an eighth 35 and an eighth is what I need this piece to be. Now the other two pieces are going to be narrower, so then when I cut this piece off, I'll cut both those pieces narrower for the sink side or the north side of the kitchen. I got two cabinets to do on that side, two uppers. Okay, so let's get started. So we're going to cut these at 30. So I like to make three lines when I do this. 
one in the out on the outside, one in the center. And then I also make sure that my my tape is pretty square, same distance between here and here, and here and here. Because if I'm off like that, well, guess what? That makes that line shorter because I'm making a radius now. So I try to keep that as square or parallel to the side, or parallel to this side. You want to rule out as much human error as possible, so you always want to be cognizant of those dimensions, and when you're measuring, make sure that you're square. Okay, so now what I'll do, I'll put the straight edge a pencil width away, a pencil width away from the mark, so when I line the pencil up, the pencil will be right on the line that I made. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm marking over one and three eighths because that's how far I'm going to make. I'm going to put this this little fence here. This is what this is is a is a fence for plywood. Uh, you can do the same thing with a, a straight piece of wood and two uh, C clamps or some kind of a clamp system. But I have to come over one and three eighths to make. The distance between the edge of the blade and also the fence guide here. I also have to consider the kerf. So one and three eighths. Burn an inch that way I don't have the slop of the end of the uh, tape catch there. And three eighths. I'm cutting right in the center of the line. That gives me just a little bit of slack when I go to put the cabinet together that it's not going to be too tight. So over the years I've always tried to get things just right on the money and fight when I try to glue it together and I get it to where it's, it fits nice but it doesn't fit too tightly because then, you, then you're trying to fight and bind and, and uh, when you're doing a glue up you want to kind of do it in a quick fashion so you don't want it sloppy you don't want to see big cracks or big gaps or anything like that but you do want to have just a little bit of give in there so that's what I'm going to do is I'm dissecting the line in two with the blade and I have two pieces of wood underneath here This is pre-finished plywood. And if you're concerned about scratches, you could put like felt or something underneath here. As you can see, I'm not too concerned about it. <laughs> Those are things to think about when you're handling expensive pieces of plywood like that. Always be concerned about the finishes. Always be concerned about scratches, rough, wrong cuts. I always like to measure two or three times, go back over my notes and recalculate, make sure that all my numbers are right before I make a cut on these things because this is expensive stuff and I bought this several years years back and I'd hate to venture to say what it costs now that piece is ready to go on the one cabinet and while I'm at it I might as well cut two more for the two cabinets over the sink so those are going to be 30 inches as well and measure back one and uh, three eighths for my fence. And the reason I like to measure three, uh, make three measurements, so in case I'm off on one measurement, if, if all three of these don't agree, then I can come back and remeasure and make sure that they all agree. I either made three of all the same mistakes or I made one mistake and I have to go back and verify. The extra measurement I make in the center is to verify my two outline outside measurements uh, it's just another way of of uh, double checking myself put these under here so I don't cut my table and I don't want to cut through these because I got a plan for those so make sure that I'm not cutting through those either I bought this thing in a garage sale. I got actually three of them in a garage sale. And I don't use them every day, but they are handy when I do need them. Oh, 
Okay, that's not going anywhere. Again, just verify my measurements. All three of my lines are right. That's going to be 30 inches. And don't pay any attention to my cord. I know it's uh, <laughs> lost all the sheathing. It's rotted off. I've had this ever since I've been in the service. I actually bought that skill saw at a pawn shop. Around military bases, there's an awful lot of pawn shops around. So the saw is really old. I got to put a new cord on it. So <laughs> anyway, kind of living, living life at my own risk here. At any rate, so we got that cut. Now we can cut these down because these are going to be over the sink, these two here. 29 and an eighth. This is actually shop grade, so it's got a couple of blemishes here and there. So if I can work them blemishes out, I'll do that. So 29 and an eighth. So I have to set the table saw up to cut off 5 and 7 eighths, and that'll give me, that'll give me enough room to cut the curve file too. So, so whenever you're figuring this, I'm going to cut this on a table saw. We're at 6 inches, so I want to drop back to 5 and 7 eighths. So I can include the curve of the saw. Okay, that takes care of the backs. 